there's still so much that we don't know about what happened. My little sister said, Ken is aware on fire. I said, I don't know. White men torched all 35 blocks of Greenwood, home to Tulsa's black community. If we want to find out what happened to the victims of the 1921 race massacre, we have to go back in time and hear from survivors. When I was awakened by my mother, she says the, the white people are killing the colored people. The whole area looked like a war zone. Somehow that horror was hidden from generations. I knew that I wanted my kids to know about Greenwood. Now teachers are arming the next generation with facts about Tulsa's past. The classroom isn't the only place people are learning about the massacre. I am shocked that, 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 that it has been so uh, concealed. HBO's new series, Watchmen, is letting the world know what went on here. The people that tried to cover it up failed. Tonight, we're lifting the fog on Tulsa's darkest secret. We are glad to have you here for this special in-depth look at the darkest chapter in our city's history. I'm Kim Jackson. And I'm Mark Bradshaw. We may be closer than ever before to finding out if there are mass graves from the race massacre. The investigation begins on Memorial Day 1921. It started on a Monday afternoon. A black shoe shiner stumbles getting onto a downtown elevator. In his effort to break the fall, he touched her, the operator the girl, and she hollered a rape. Robert Fairchild was 17 when it happened, but he never forgot how that accident would change his world. A day later, police arrested the shoe shiner. Fueled by inaccurate newspaper reports, a white mob made its way to the courthouse. There were rumors of lynching the teenager. The street was full of people. And of course, uh, Never profanity, never drinking. Before long, the black community showed up to defend the young man. With tempers flaring on that unusually hot May day, someone <laughs> fired the first shot, but it would not be the last. I was afraid, very, very scared. And they broke in and took what they wanted and they set it on fire. People coming out with their chandeliers, their curtains, their pretty things. And so that's what happened. The mobs looted that 35 block area. The initial militia, uh, some of the survivors said the initial militia just stood back and let it happen. By nightfall, flames swept across what was known as Black Wall Street. Uh, around about 11 o'clock, all you could see was black smoke coming up and you could hear the gunfire. More than 800 people were hurt, and to this day, we still don't know how many were killed. The best guess is as many as 300. We can't change what happened all those decades ago, but we can make sure that no one forgets. Well, you can't understand your nation, your people, unless you know what experiences happened to the people. You cannot understand black Tulsans today unless you know that this event happened. We developed an understanding of one another and appreciating one another and respecting one another. And the net result was we had peace from then on. What they didn't have was answers, but that could soon change. This is the only location where I feel we have fairly compelling evidence that it may hold uh, victims of the riot. This is essentially a pit that has been dug into the ground. That's the Oklahoma archaeologist who headed up the initial investigation in 1999. Fast forward to now, and we are finally following up on the leads his team found back then. I sat down with Tulsa's mayor recently to find out why it's taken 20 years to try and get answers to Tulsa's darkest secret. Are there victims buried in mass graves? So if you're murdered in our city, you should be able to just take it for granted that the city is going to do whatever it needs to do to find out what happened to you and bring justice for your family. And Mayor G.T. Bynum says it doesn't matter whether it happened last night or a century ago. He's asking all of us to think about how we'd feel if it was our grandmother who disappeared. And then you lived in a city that said, yeah, no, we're not going to search for him. We're not going to tell you, try to find out what happened to him. Like, and then we question why there are issues of uh, racial disparity in our city and challenges between the city government 
uh, and black Tulsans. Uh, that should not be a surprise when we've had a city government for 98 years that hasn't been willing to follow through on this. Let's talk about the search for the mass graves. What's the latest right now? So uh, we had the Oklahoma Archaeological Survey here for a little over two weeks um, doing uh, scanning using ground penetrating radar and other technology that's much more advanced uh, since the last time anyone attempted to do this work. They can see, if you will, with much greater precision and clarity than they could have 20 years ago. If nothing is found in the, in the results, how much longer will this search go on? You know, that how long it will go, no one could say. Uh, because one of the things that uh, we've found through this process, once we made it public that we were undergoing this search, all of a sudden, all these people came forward with different stories. What we found was there was this huge untapped reservoir of oral histories that have been passed down through families over a century in our community. Historians are going through their stories to see if there are other places we should be looking. For now, the focus is on two sites, Oakland Cemetery and New Block Park. And even if we find nothing at either of these sites, it's important for black Tulsans to know that their community is trying to do right by their ancestors. So you think even though if nothing is found, uh, the education part of this is, is maybe worth it there. People are being educated, they're finding out more, learning about what happened. It is definitely drawing out a dialogue in our community around what happened. I mean, now we're having debates uh, about whether it's a riot or a massacre. And there are people who feel like one word is more applicable than the other. How important I, was that to, to change that? Oh, I think it was important uh, because a riot implies that this was a two-sided affair, uh, and it was not. Why is this search so important to you? It's important to me because I think it's it reflects where we are in Tulsa today. Uh, we cannot change what happened in 1921. We only have control over what we do right now. And I don't think that most Tulsans want this to be a city where we think there might be mass graves in our city and we don't try and find out if that's true or not. So, so what happens next when you find, if and when you find something? So if the archaeological survey identifies an anomaly in the soil, which is what they're looking for with their equipment, uh, then we would have a discussion about whether or not we're going to do excavation. Mayor says just because we find remains doesn't mean they're from the race massacre. A lot of people died in a Spanish flu epidemic two years earlier. All right, joining us now are some of the men and women refusing to let the massacre remain Tulsa's darkest secret. We want to begin with Senator Kevin Matthews. And Senator Kevin Matthews, we know that you are on the Public Oversight Committee and you will be one of the people who helps decide whether or not we excavate based on the evidence. So kind of tell us about the process of what you all have been going through. Well, actually, um, our city councilor, Vanessa Al Harper, uh, brought this to the forefront in the city. And uh, she has uh, assembled a, actually a board of uh, people with the ancestral society, Native Americans, African Americans from the community, elected officials, all the way up to the mayor. And it's an extensive process of not only getting information from the public and hearing those oral stories, but then bringing experts like uh, at least one of the ones that we have today that could tell us what we would do if we do find uh, remains. There are some particular issues around not only the science of uh, finding out DNA, but uh, other issues like tribal issues and, and how sensitive that is uh, if we find tribal remains. It's a very sensitive issue. Yeah, we're going to hear about that a little bit later there. Let's bring in uh, Kevin Ross, your race massacre expert. How likely are we to find mass graves? I think with all the indications over the years of what was could have been a rumor mill came to a point where everybody is, is agreed upon, like Oakland Cemetery where the store is passed down from one caretaker to the next caretaker or where the riot dead may possibly be. Uh, you have people telling stories about underneath the freeway near the Oakland Cemetery. Those stories were highly suspected with the riot commission when it sought to see the answers back in 2001 in their report. So we had the power of oral history that was able to be documented and that's 
one of the reasons why the committee sought for these three. Although there are stories of other places around the city and outside the city as well, but these three were the ones that was most likely the right uh, dead or buried. And so, uh, Kevin, how do you feel that the community is looking at this right now? We're waiting on the results. And so at this point, how do you think the community feels? Well, I, I think if anything, they like me, relieved. Uh, for me, I've uh, been dealing with this issue for going on 10 years alone by one particular graveyard out on 91st Street. But seeing now that Tulsa is ready to deal with its past. And I'm, I'm just absolutely just feel that what we're doing here in Tulsa, we're on the right side of history right now, and it's on our watch to do the right thing. How are you joining us now? Our University of Tulsa Assistant Professor of Anthropology, Dr. Alicia Odawali, and State Representative John Waldron, who spent 10 years teaching history at Booker T. Washington High School. And Dr. Odawali, we know that you are a part of the research team that spent time out there with the radar penetrating uh, machines that were out at the cemetery. And we also know that you have worked five years on other archaeological sites. So if we do not find remains here this time, what else is there for us to learn? There's a lot we can learn outside of just finding evidence of bodies buried, because there could be uh, grave goods that are included with those people, but also looking more towards the housing, the businesses, the schools, the churches, all the things that were part of the historic Greenwood District are important for this story to tell. And archeology span can reveal all of these aspects, not just the human remains. Representative Waldron, you live here in Tulsa. You're raising a son here. Uh, you taught school here for many years. What does this surge nearly a century later say to future generations? It's such an important message to future generations. I mean, you can't really understand what it means to be a Tulsan without coming to terms with all of its history. And you're right, this is the darkest moment in the history of Tulsa. I want my son to grow up knowing what happened and understanding what it means to be a Tulsan today. But so many generations don't know that or didn't know that that's and weren't true. taught that. Yes, and that's a terrible crime. Uh, generations of Tulsans were robbed of an essential piece of their history. And so now we're learning about the, the massacre, learning about the graves. And Mr. Ross, you know, you have covered this for so many years and um, you, you're a historian here in town. Have you heard about any other grave sites? Well, we did uh, come across some information of the one in 91st, I think it's an issue with that uh, as far as being, having permission to go out there and search for it. Uh, Crown Hill was another location. But there's other places outside the city. Uh, we had one gentleman that called in and stated that uh, in Purcell, Oklahoma, that bodies were buried there. And the person that was telling him was a sheriff, so he had all this, this knowledge of it. By the time we got to him, he had passed away. And so those one of those we almost we almost were there. So, but they still coming in. We still uh, hearing those stories. And the more we talk about it, people feel, feeling free enough to share what they've learned. And that's more that's really important because it does make our community that much closer if we start sharing those stories. How, how important is it to when you look at all these different places to to search to narrow it down or to to know for a fact and possibly there's something there because as more and more come, you know. Yeah. Well, I think we need to research all areas, rumor or not, because uh, we just don't know. There's no neon sign with a big arrow say, here they are. You know, we relying on technology, we're relying on oil history, and we just got to take our time at this. It's, we, we're not on a deadline. How is it possible to search on every rumor about where graves could be? We start with a telephone call when somebody will call in and said, well, I, my mom told me that they were buried over here. Y'all need to look over here. <clears throat> we even got calls that was over there uh, in the Rudisil Library area, you know. So <clears throat> people know these different stories and we're just, and just making piece by piece. Some may be legit, some not be legit. But I think while we got the technology to at least be able to go scan the area to see there's a possible disturbance underneath the ground. Senator Matthews, you heard the mayor say a few minutes ago, for the better part of a century, we've had a city government that has not followed through on the search for the mass graves. Why did, why was that all those years, no follow through and why now? Well, first of all, I want to say that uh, 
it's significant that we have Mr. Ross here because his father was Don Ross. Uh, he and Senator Maxine Horner in 2001 did an extensive study and made specific recommendations that fell on deaf ears. And when I became an elected official and I talked to the people at the Greenwood Cultural Center and others in the community, this was a sore spot that this had not been addressed and I felt it was my responsibility. That's why I wrote Senate Bill, Senate Bill 17 to create a revolving fund uh, to be able to address uh, this story of Black Wall Street, the 1921 uh, Centennial massacre uh, and that change was part of it as well and so uh, I felt that it was my responsibility to bring it back up and uh, fortunately enough uh, the leadership that we have currently at the mayor's office in the legislature and uh, even the governor uh, has sought fit to not only address the issue but fund the issue and uh, be transparent and so I'm excited that uh, the work that was done in 2001, part of it's being addressed today. Senator Matthews, thank you. Thanks to the Smithsonian Channel, we can see the Greenwood District in all of its vibrant color. Angelica Brown shows us a nearly 100-year-old video lost for decades. Rare, colorized video shows life returning to the Greenwood District just a few short years after the massacre. You can see kids coming out of Booker T. Washington High School, one of the few buildings untouched. The streets once again a flurry, the sidewalks packed with people going about their day, the ladies dressed in furs, the men just as dapper. While business on Black Wall Street seems back to normal, life would never be the same. Stores like SD Hooker and Company Clothing would be rebuilt, but the emotional damage done in those 14 hours would last lifetimes. Fueled with rage and armed with weapons more at home on battlefields in some far off land than urban America. It was just the sound of this bricks, stones, buildings blown up. You just, just the uh, war torn plates. White men manned machine guns on the ground and used planes to target families trying to escape. And all them poor little colored folks that live right there on Archie, we didn't see them no more. They, they killed them folks. We'd later learn police officers supplied some of the guns and ammo to mobs, and that's not all. Many of whom participated in the looting, burning, bombing, and murder under the color of law. When it was over, Black Wall Street would stand in ruins, but it wouldn't stay that way. B.C. Franklin challenged an ordinance passed days after the massacre to prevent the community from rebuilding, and the Oklahoma Supreme Court sided with him. So life went on, but folks in Greenwood still too afraid to talk about what had happened. You, you didn't want to be labeled as a troublemaker. You didn't want to uh, uh, maybe end up or disappear. A lot of other Tulsans were too ashamed, so they tried to act like it never happened, creating a wound that never healed. Now, more than 860,000 hours later, it's those 14 that still haunt us. Those are powerful images. Uh, wow. Dr. Odawale, you're working on a project right now to uncover buried history in the Greenwood District. Tell us more about that. Well, it's called Mapping Historical Trauma in Tulsa from 1921 to 2021, because we're seeking to put a little bit of a capstone on this centennial experience by researching from 1921 to 2021, this shifting imprint and landscape of Greenwood, how it has changed through time. Uh, not just looking at a map, but literally how our memory of Greenwood has changed through time and how our understanding of Greenwood has changed through time. So we need the mapping evidence, we need archeological evidence, we need all of our literary evidence and all of our uh, archival material together to piece together a, a story from 1921 to 2021. We owe a lot to bring the whole group in here, a lot to B.C. Franklin, because I, from what I understand, uh, a lot of the people were not allowed to rebuild after that, and he made that possible to rebuild the Greenwood area. Mm -hmm. Yes. He, uh, the city at that time <clears throat> and the powers that be had created ordinances that you could not build on scorched lands and they made it illegal and then also people who needed 
bricks and mortar and wood. They were, uh, they were refused lumber. They were refused to, uh, to buy bricks. They were told not to build, but they built anyway. And so B.C. Franklin told his community, build, build with anything, even with orange crates if you have to, just build. And of course, they, since they made it illegal, the police will arrest them. He go bail them out and re represent them in court. But he just, don't sell your land. You gotta keep your land. He kept the fight going. We're learning so much about um, what happened during the massacre, and you all all have ties to Booker T. Washington High School, the high school that was used as the Red Cross Hospital. How important is it to let people know, you know, what Tulsa was like then, and the fact that you had a school that was actually there? Yeah, I so, think that's essential. You know, uh, Buck Franklin's son, John Hope Franklin, graduated from Booker T. and became one of the preeminent historians of African American history. He demonstrated to a whole nation that you can't under understand American history without un understanding African American history. It's so important that there is a Booker T. Washington Memorial now where Booker T. Washington wants to do it on the current OSU uh, Tulsa campus. Uh, and it, They've done a great job of capturing that history and, and telling that story at the Booker T. Washington Memorial on Greenwood right now. And, and the video we've been seeing here, it's amazing. And we're very thankful that survived because that does tell us a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes, it does. We also need to note that uh, along with what Kevin has just told us, uh, they were denied insurance claims because uh, it was called a riot. Being named a riot caused them not to be able to, to uh, collect on insurance claims, and that also is a sore spot with many people from the area. Mount Zion had to pay two mortgages to rebuild the church. They had to pay off the old mortgage, uninsured, and then they had to build a new one, uh, and that was an enormous effort and a symbol of the community's determination to stay in Greenwood. And there's still a call right now for reparations after all these years. Well, you know, a lot of the survivors that I had interviewed for the riot commission years ago, they all had, they were able to tell a story at the age of five of what life was like during that hell. They call it hell. And to get back what was taken from them, it's tearful, it's sad, because a lot of them, they just died angry because Tulsa did not do the right thing then. So hopefully, while they're in heavens, we can do the right thing and they can see us from there. Well said. Well, don't go anywhere. We have a lot more to talk about. How the new series Watchmen is exposing Tulsa's darkest secret to the world. And HBO is allowing us to show you the entire opening scene that recreated the race massacre. Plus, transforming the site of so many deaths into something beautiful, paying tribute to victims. I guess I was more afraid, too afraid to be surprised. I guess I'll put it that way, because I woke up just ready to run. 
It wasn't until 2000 that plans to build a memorial to remember the victims of the 1921 race massacre really got underway. But it would be another decade before we dedicated John Hope Franklin Reconciliation Park. Now it serves as a symbol of life and hope in an area once known for racism and death. The memorial, though, pays tribute to more than just victims of the race massacre. The Tower of Reconciliation at the park center tells the story of Native Americans forced to walk the Trail of Tears. And and of the brave black men who fought and won the Battle of Honey Springs, defeating the Confederates and giving control of Indian territory to the Union Army. One and a half million people saw what, based on survivor accounts, is a pretty accurate look at the 1921 race massacre. Coming up, we'll show you the scene and hear from the woman who recreated Tulsa's darkest secret for the world to see. We also talked with Tulsa native Tim Blake Nelson about his character in Watchmen. When we say the race massacre has been swept under the rug for decades, it wasn't until seven decades later that the first documentary was made about it. Producers spent four years putting it together called Little Africa on Fire. The goal was to finally get people talking about that chapter in Tulsa's history. And with the current surge for mass graves, the race massacre has been in the news a lot lately. But as Aaron Christie shows us, the new HBO series Watchmen is introducing Tulsa's darkest secret to the world. And based on survivor testimony, it stays true to what happened. We received special permission to show you the entire opening sequence recreating the Tulsa race massacre. Let's take a look. Ain't no room. 
push the boy there. Hey, hey, God it, OB. It's gonna be okay, baby, right? You're gonna go with Heck and Lydia, and they're gonna get you someplace safe. Are you telling the truth? We're gonna be right behind you. Okay. It was extremely powerful and moving. Did it did it play out exactly the way that you wanted it to? It really did. Um, we planned that scene down to like every detail. We, we really tried to put the stores where they existed as much as possible. Nicole Cassell is one of the show's executive producers. She also directed the first two episodes, including that recreation of Tulsa's race massacre. It will all tie together why 1921 needed to be depicted and we actually start with a boy who says there will be no mob just today trust in the law like those opening lines are essential to the whole story and that little boy um and who is he Tulsa native Tim Blake Nelson says it was Cassell who sold him on the show. He plays Looking Glass, a Tulsa police detective with a knack for interrogations and a mask to remember. But the character's original look wasn't what Nelson envisioned. He just seemed, in terms of the way that Damon had written him, to be a little more of a badass than the way they were costuming him. And I guess I brought in... Uh, a measure of my own understanding from having grown up in Tulsa, what I felt this guy might want to wear. And so we went with uh, what I call more of a rock and roll Western look. I have a secret plan to save humanity. And it starts in Oklahoma. So what are you hoping that people take away from this when it comes to the massacre and education and um, our culture? Well, first and foremost, I think that the the show meaning to examine justice, how we define justice, what reparations mean, what vigilantism means. Those are really the currents running through the show. Nelson says the masks that they wear are kind of a double-edged sword. They not only allow um, for the detectives on the, this version of the Tulsa Police Force anonymity, but they allow us to uh, behave in an extrajudicial way because we can't be identified. There's so much to explore in who these characters are. Are there any actual heroes? Is anybody truly good, truly bad? Um, and what is going on in our country around race? We don't do lollipops and rainbows because we know those are pretty colors that just hide what the world really is. Black and white. And in a deeper way, it's also examining where we are in terms of uh, racial statics in America and how we're afraid of other people who don't look like us. Both Nelson and Cassell say the show finds a way not only to entertain, but to address serious issues in a thoughtful and sensitive way. And to add to that potency of the first scene, it happened to fall on the massacre's 97th anniversary. Talk to me about how that affected the mood of the set. It was very profound and moving. Um, it was also our first day of filming. And, you know, it, it was in, uh, you know, to say it was intense to be recreating this is an understatement. Watchmen has a lot of Americans talking about something that we've avoided for the better part of a century. So I would assume that's a good thing that people are talking about that. Absolutely. Right. So Kevin, how does it make you feel? Uh, you you had a camera and you were doing interviews long before it was the thing to do. Um, you were a much younger man decades oh, ago. Yeah, how many it, pounds ago. <laughs> How does it make you feel that so many people now are paying attention to what you uh, basically took as a passion years ago? Oh my goodness. Um, to, to see this production totally took me off guard. I worked with numerous uh, media productions over the years, and most of the documentaries that have been produced over the years, but I didn't see this one coming. And it just the, the film itself, that opening scene, just, I was just so it hit it right on the head. And so it pulled me into the series. So I'm now I'm a Watchmen fan now. Just basically just that, that one scene that pulled me in. And one thing that's magical right about now, because we're in a magical moment, I think, here in Tulsa, because we're facing our darkest 
pages in, his, in our history books. And I think one thing we tried to do, one thing I like to do is push, pass down to the other kids, you know, you got a cell phone, use that camera, go talk to your family, find out your roots, tell your story, you know. And so that's kind of, uh, I think it's magical because now people are trying to find out what about their family's history. And that can be important if we get to the point of finding the mass graves, finding the skeletal remains, if we're going to do any kind of DNA. Well, we've got to know where we've been so we know where we're going. Let's get back to the Watchmen. Uh, there are many communities in this country that have racial conflict. How do you feel that the Watchmen picked Tulsa um, to, to uh, focus on our racial divide in our darkest moment. Is that is that good? Do you think that's good? Yeah, I think that's good and it's tremendously important. I mean, we live in a time of national polarization, fear of immigrants, uh, white nationalism. Uh, it's very much like 1921. But this time, Tulsa has an opportunity to lead the country out of the national mess we're facing by showing that we can come together and embrace our history. You think that many other cities can follow our lead? Many on others should, yes. How do you I think that not only other cities, I think that we can be uh, a catalyst for race relations around the world. Tulsa, uh, Oklahoma is the only state in the United States that did not have one county vote for the first black president of the United States. It's the only state in the United States that not one county did that. And that was, that's significant. And so uh, there, we have a, uh, a sore history around race relations and for us to now have the courage to talk about such a sensitive subject and be able to uh, talk about it uh, for the world to see with the new history center we're building, with the curriculum that we're now uh, putting out across the state, I think it says something about going from the most severe or the worst massacre of Americans upon Americans and now having so many people in our state and across the country embrace this story. And to piggyback off of Kevin is that, I mean, years ago I interviewed Desmond Tutu who came to Tulsa mm -hmm. and I asked him about what is the world's view of Tulsa and its incident of 1921 and he stated that Tulsa is sitting on a powder keg because it refused to deal with its past. And he said, but if Tulsa did with race relations, Tulsa can become a jewel to the world. And that's what one of my goals. Yeah. And Dr. Adelbelli, um, you, you're watching this too from, I'm sure, looking at the history of it. Mm -hmm. We are valuing history. What, what's your takeaway from seeing Watchmen? I think it's important to focus on Tulsa because it is the single instance, the worst instance of racial violence in our nation, but it's not the only one. So to talk about how this plays into the national conspiracy, really, of white supremacy. Uh, we talked about the Red Summer of 1919, but this is well after that, but this is still a national issue that hasn't been dealt with. And so I think the sh what the show, I really like about the show is that it talks about white supremacy and that this is a national thing we have to look at. And so looking at one case study is one way, but they're jumping through time, they're jumping through states, they're jumping through cities all through the show to show you just how uh, this permeates our very nation. Okay. Watchmen fans on social media said they were shocked that they did not learn this about this in school, but even here in Oklahoma, it wasn't something kids were required to learn until recently. I wanted them to understand that um, a boy stepping off an elevator was not the reason this happened. This was many years in the works. It's not just the history Mrs. Pierce is making sure they learn, how she's teaching them to prevent it from ever happening again.
You cannot understand black Tulsans today unless you know that this event happened. But Tulsa's darkest secret stayed secret for generations. It wasn't talked about, let alone taught in schools. Now a new curriculum is helping teachers to navigate this very difficult subject. Neely Jones introduces us to a woman using Tulsa's past to create a better future. Guys ready? Come in. Sign seats, please. Candace Pierce teaches seventh graders at Tulsa's Thoreau Demonstration Academy. When it comes to the 1921 race massacre, she doesn't skirt the issue just because it can be uncomfortable. We hit the race issue head on in my class. First, Mrs. Pierce says it's important to make students feel comfortable. I'm very candid with my class. Are you comfortable with um, the term African American? Are you comfortable with um, the term black? Um, how would you like people to address, how do we want to address everybody in this class and let's all come to a consensus? Let's all learn together and let's all figure this out together in a non-threatening environment. She says that's important because everyone's worried about saying the wrong thing and it's okay if they do. Mrs. Pierce's solution is use it as a teaching moment where the class can explore different thoughts and feelings together. This is something students are talking about, but they're not talking about it with adults. The problem, Mrs. Pierce says, students aren't always having appropriate conversations, and she wants to make sure they know how to talk about race the right way. Because I'm teaching what's on my heart and what I know they're going to benefit from. To do that, she can't just feed her kids facts. She has to make them think, and some of the questions they're trying to answer are ones adults have struggled with for generations. And as Tolsons, how do we move forward in our city and bring us back together and get rid of that social segregation that we see everywhere in our schools and in our city? And I want them to be armed with all this information and them to go out and feel like, feel empowered to do it. She's not holding back any information. Mrs. Pierce says you can't know what was lost unless you know how vibrant and amazing Black Wall Street was before it burned. And you can't understand the race massacre without knowing what race relations were like in 1921. We go through and talk about the Klan and their involvement in Oklahoma. Mrs. Pierce says studying old Klan propaganda not only gives students a better picture of our history, it's also preparing them for the here and now, especially with all the fake news on social media. Can we tell if somebody is um, trying to dupe us into believing something that we shouldn't believe? That's really important that they learn that the skill of analysis. But she knows that knowledge isn't enough. Bad men need nothing more to compass their ends than that good men should look on and do nothing. And I think that in itself was one of the biggest lessons is we can learn about something and now we need to go do something with it. And what are we going to do with it? At the end of the day, Mrs. Pierce hopes her kids walk out her door prepared to be a better student and a better Tulsan kind to lead us into the future. Teacher is well spoken, right? Mm -hmm. Senator Matthews, y'all put together that curriculum for teachers. Uh, how did that go? It went very well, and I'm so proud of that teacher because I met some of those students, and we want adults to model what they've done, to have the dialogue and have these courageous conversations. And she talked about the social segregation that we have, and that would change if we were courageous enough to just have the conversations. Whether we agree or disagree, we can learn from each other. And uh, part of that curriculum was developed by getting information from the community, historians like Hannibal Johnson, uh, and teachers that teach social studies and history put that together, and now they're teaching it to teachers. And Representative Waldron, you were a history teacher before mm -hmm, you went right. to the legislature. So mm -hmm. how important is it for teachers to have that curriculum in their hands to go from? It's essential. I mean, the, the massacre has been in the curriculum for a long time. But what does that mean? What tools are we giving our teachers to start those conversations, to educate the, pe the young people, and to get them, them to confront our history and move on from it? We saw a clip earlier from the Watchmen. Would that be a good part of the curriculum? Ooh, that's a good question. I Ms. Pierce's middle school uh, students might be a little too young. Maybe for high them. school. Right? Maybe high school. Right. Though I think you'd need to supervise that content a little bit. But that would what a powerful way to get young people to think about our history. Well, as much as we learned about what happened that terrible day, it's still hard to imagine what it was like living through it. Let's hear from a few of the survivors in their own words. The bullets were just raining down over us. It's airplanes were up, just raining down the bullets. And I could see them, and I heard them, and I was so frightened, I pulled away from my parents. 
Well, when bullets falling around, you don't know whether to run, whether to lay down, whether to sit, or what. You, you just standing there this way. Uh -huh. When the planes would fly over, we would see them dropping something to the rooftops of the different houses and set in them on fire. And they would tell us to stay away from the windows because they were shooting in the windows and things like that. And as we went out the door, you could see telephone poles falling and fire. And that's when my little sister said, can is the world on fire? I said, I don't know. Four men with torches in their hands. They set our house on fire and went right straight to the curtains and set the curtains on fire. All four of us got up under the bed. One of the guys coming past the bed stepped on my finger and I was, as I was about to scream, my sister put her hand over my mouth so I couldn't be heard. Two or three of my sisters and brothers were ducking and dodging and running. Tom Bright was his name, uh -huh. but we never heard from Tom Bright uh -huh. anymore after the ride. People were killed, and you go in and see the people mangled, uh -huh. and then some people you never heard of That's... anymore. You don't know where they, where they were killed, mm -hmm. where they just left town. So I was about 18, uh, but uh, I heard the old folks say that we couldn't find them nowhere. And, so, and um, I mean, they say others too, uh, but I, I know he died. We did have curfew when I got back and the National Guard was here to guard us. Well, I hated all white people because uh, that's, that's who was destroying us and doing everything. But I changed, changed that attitude after. Mr. Wilcox was so nice. My father had been working for him a long time. He treated him like a real human being. All in all, that's my story about the race ride at five years old. Mr. Kevin Ross, um, you were looking at the video we're watching, and you interviewed mm -hmm. those survivors. Most of them are gone now. All of them are gone. And just a few. I interviewed one here, yes. luckily, but I mean. The ones that are in the, mm -hmm. uh, in the film, all those that was interviewed uh, for the race ride commission, all of those had passed. How hard was it for you to see and how hard was it for you to hear one of those tragic stories, one after another, when you're doing those interviews? When these folks talk, they talk like in pictures. These people, they grew up without television, so they were able to tell a story so vividly, you know, and you just can't help but to be right there on the spot. The, the, the descriptions of everything, the details, and, and I miss them so much, especially the George Monroe and Papa Clark and all those guys mm -hmm. that told those wonderful stories. You know, they told the story to the world before they left this world. Mm -hmm. And those are just very precious. You know, and I think that uh, today's children can learn a lot of what those folks went through and for us to learn as well as a people. I want to bring in the whole group here. If mass graves are found, would this bring closure to um, one of Tulsa's darkest moments? I don't know. I think uh, maybe not the uh, beginning of the end, but maybe the end of the beginning. Yeah. Um, because we would still have a lot to talk about, and it's the work of many generations, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, for something that's been hidden so long, those who most were affected are no longer here, but it's us that are still here dealing with it. Uh, will we get over it? Will it be the end of the story? I agree with you. It's a beginning. It's a step. It's a, a, among many steps that we must take here in Tulsa, but I think we'd be that much closer as a people here in Tulsa as we go on this journey. I, I think it would reduce a lot of the angry emotion because uh, we're showing respect, and that's really a big part of uh, what has happened by hiding this, it seemed to be so disrespectful and so painful. And so uh, dealing with that would take away that portion. But then uh, we still have the question of reparations and how to repair that damage, but it would take away a lot of the thoughts about the disrespect that happened by not acknowledging. And Dr. Ottawella, you're still gathering details of the story with the artifacts. Just having this, these oral stories, does that help you in your search? It actually made it more complicated. 
because I expected whenever I started my research for starting new archaeology in Greenwood, I expected to have to collect all of this information in Tulsa, but there's so much of the archival evidence that's outside of the city that people don't even know exists. So out in my research, trying to collect all of the archives and all of the uh, exhibit material that have anything to do with our history, I've identified 26 institutions. Most of those are outside of Tulsa. So there's a serious barrier to even getting access to our own history that we mm. still have to address. Uh, so even if we do find our mass graves, if, if we find one, it doesn't mean there won't be others. And it doesn't mean that's the end of the conversation because we still need to actively look for our people and our history and put the two together. As we look forward to healing in the future there, Senator Matthews, uh, there's a history center that uh, will help us with that. Yes, we hope to break ground in January of 2020. There'll be a, t a history center that tells the story uh, prior to uh, the glory of Black Wall Street, the glory of Black, Black Wall Street and then the massacre, and then the resilience that this community has shown. And people that want to support this can go to www.tulsa2021.org. And because of the Watchmen uh, show, we do have a GoFundMe for people to support it. Where will this history center be? That'll be on Greenwood. It'll be just south of the current Greenwood Cultural Center, right along Greenwood, uh, some six to 7,000 square feet. And it'll be a vivid account of what happened before, during, and after that incident. It'll be a great way to learn about it. It would be a shame that we only have the story being told in Washington, D.C. at the National African American Museum of History and Culture and not here. We will now have the, the story being told right here on Greenwood. And how can people that are watching this or people that see our newscast that we're, that we're running right now, how can they get involved? Well, Phil Armstrong is uh, the person that's on Greenwood every day at the Greenwood Cultural Center. And he is our project director. But people can go to our website, www.tulsa2021.org. They can go by and see Phil at the Greenwood Cultural Center and get involved. We want everyone involved. This is a great way to turn that terrible tragedy into triumph as we move forward. On that note, uh, we want to thank uh, Mr. Ross, Senator Matthews, Dr. Odawali, and Representative Waldron for being here tonight. We hope their unique perspectives on the race massacre inspire and empower you to stand up for what's right. And we want to thank you for joining us for what we feel is a very important issue as our community moves forward together. I'm Kim Jackson. And I'm Mark Bradshaw. Good night.